Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever in the world you are joining us from. Welcome to the AK 2021 Art and Book Festival. Now in its ninth year, with the theme, Generational Discordance. My name is Rona Maya, and I'm a journalist, and I'll be serving as moderator for this panel discussion titled Politics and Activism. Due to some undeniably major victories against entrenched interests, and the social political elite. Technology and the convening power of the internet have been instrumental to these developments. This panel today will examine the lessons of the past and reimagine how we can apply the current increase in interconnected power towards achieving societal change today and for the future. Now, I'm not alone, clearly. I have with me a distinguished panel of guests. Starting with One Love the Kubolo. He's a Ghanaian Romanian music maker, filmmaker, and activist who is a foremost advocate in Ghana for human rights. And he's outspoken and famed for his resistance over environmental protection and corruption issues. Also with us today is Tari Taylor, a media professional and TV producer with 14 years of experience serving clients in the private social development and government sectors. She is a candidate of the Youth Party and ran for Office of Councillor in Etiosa local government area in Lagos State. We are also going to be joined by Dr. Jibrin Ibrahim, who is the director of the Center for Democracy and Development, a regional research advocacy and training NGO covering West Africa. He's a political scientist and development expert with over 30 years of active engagement with civil society. And you can share your thoughts using hashtag AKFest21. Welcome everyone, Tari. You can be said to represent the present in the sense that you ran for, for office of councillor and most of the mobilization you did was offline. Now, what worked in terms of convening people and what didn't work? Thank you and hello to everyone. Okay, so you know what, Rona, you, 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 you were shying away from saying the lowest level of government. But I take, I, great, oh, oh. <laughs> I take great pride, you know, in, that, um, in being able to run at that capacity because the fact that the office of the councillor is the, is the lowest elected office makes it the closest government to the people. So the local government is the government that, that, you know, that has the capacity to impact the lives of everyday people much more than any other pair of government. You are correct. A lot of my um, engagement was offline because as much as it's great to you know, be on social media, it, that really serves as awareness. What social media does is that it creates a lot of awareness, you know, but it does not necessarily convert to vote, you know, which is what it takes to win an election. So um, my campaign saw me going into a lot of the communities that make up my constituency, most of them um, very low, low income, you know, earning um, survival communities, as you know, as we can call them. Um, getting to know and understand the challenges that the people are facing and, you know, working with them to, to come up with solutions, both for the long term and for the immediate short term. I, I believe that, you know, when you talk about politics and activism, I believe that they are mutually exclusive exercises, even though many times, you know, the outcomes of both are, 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 able, are able to marry the outcomes of, of politics and activism, but they are two very different things. And activists may not necessarily be effective in the political space. Likewise, a politician may not be an effective activist. And I believe that that's one thing that our generation needs to understand, that as much as there is a place for activism, you know, it's great, it's great to hold our government to account, it's great to protest, you know, it's our constitutional right as citizens. However, we also need to know where to draw the line. We also need to know when it is a time for governance, when it is a time to put solutions on the table and implement those solutions. You know, I feel that um, 
we have learned both from the generations that have gone ahead of us and now even our generation, we have become very proficient at protest and activism, which makes us a reactive people. So we are not taking the for we're not going to the forefront and taking the challenges, literally the bull by the horn and proposing solutions and using all the strengths that we bring, you know, to, to drive those solutions which translate to good governance for our people. So I think that um, we really need to start to understand the place of activism, activism and the, I believe right now, more crucial and more necessary place for governance and, you know, understand how to navigate both to get the best for the, for the communities that we represent. I'll come to you, Jibrin. Um, we are looking at the convening power of the internet and how it shifts the balance of power to the people. Uh, now, you've been a witness to pre-internet times, not to age you, um, but you have been a witness as well as a documenter of people coming together um, in the struggle against military rule. And now you're currently an academic studying the way the internet shapes democratic engagement. But I just ask you, what differences can you point to in terms of the way people mobilize um, between then and now? First of all, maybe we should interrogate your question. Is it true that the internet has shifted the balance of media power in favor of the people? I think that's a basic assumption that's often not as accurate as it seems. Yes, millions of Nigerians, tens of millions of Nigerians have access to the internet and through various applications such as Twitter, Facebook and all that are able to communicate their ideas. But these ideas are communicated through applications that run on algorithms. And those algorithms select what they want others to see. And often, those that get the most massive coverage are those that provoke conflict, that provoke controversy, that are able to generate large amounts of profits for these internet companies. Therefore, yes, the voice of the people can be heard now, but at the same time, the strongest voice that's heard is that of the major internet companies who are privileging, focusing on, and making trend specific types of messages that generate profit for them. The important issue about the social media today is that the control of that media space is generated by multinational companies who want to use it to make a lot of profit for themselves. To go back to your question on the difference between advocacy at that time uh, and advocacy today, I think maybe a major factor for me is the nature of organization itself. I became an activist on entering university uh, 1973-74. And that was when there were progressive cycles within the university that uh, brought us in as it were and oriented us towards activism. The most important feature of activism at that time for me w was what are you advocating? For us, we had a vision of a progressive Nigeria, of a progressive world, of equity in society, about the combat against exploitation. And those were the things we engage in advocacy on. How did we do the advocacy? We formed associations 
At that time, the term civil society had not yet uh, emerged in general discourse. So these progressive associations, we used to do advocacy. We would, for example, prepare and distribute pamphlets. How do you prepare and uh, distribute pamphlets? You raised money among yourselves. You do the content of the pamphlets. You go to a printer, you pay, it's printed. And then you come back and distribute it among the general population. So the issue in our time was the personal commitment of the activists themselves. There was no grant available for any advocacy at that time. So those who engaged in ad advocacy did that with their own uh, resources. And I feel that's a huge difference with later times when the issue of grants and formal civil society organizations registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission emerged. And therefore, people with resources, including foreign countries, will generate grants and distribute them to groups that they felt were doing advocacy that was similar to what they wanted. So you these days fit into a specific structure and availability of resources that are sometimes dictated by others rather than what uh, you generate uh, yourself. I think the major, the second major uh, element of advocacy in our time was that a personal contact was extremely important. You went around, you spoke to people, you organized meetings, you had study groups where you sit down after lectures in the university in the evening and you study the issue you read available books, you go to the library, and then you, based on that knowledge, talk to others who you think you can convince. And when you do, you start having these advocacy meetings. So it was a much more direct engagement with people that was not mediated by uh, either external factors or even by organs such as the internet that can decide which one they want to trend and which one they don't want to trend. Okay, I'm going to go to you one, love. You are one of several Ghanaians in Ghana and in the diaspora who are uh, meeting, collaborating, convening, mainly through the internet, to fight against a bill that seeks to criminalize the LGBTIQA community and its allies. Um, in what ways can you tell us? Can you tell us a bit about um, this whole process of convening and how has technology um, served this movement? Are there any lessons we can draw elsewhere from the continent? I'm quite curious. Thank you, Rona, for the question. Um, several is, I don't find several to be an adequate word because it mm. may mislead us to think that it's like, maybe hundreds to thousands of people. I, we can say a handful. Okay. And, and we can also say, I mean, we can say, yeah, a handful, especially if we're talking about allies. I feel members of the LGBTQ community who are um, advocating against this bill are, are just um, doing it to survive. And so they, can't, they shouldn't be counted as you know, like the opposition or the support. Now, um, what do you mean survive? Do you care to expand on that or would you like to just move on to your answer? One love. Um, f a few years ago, I mean, up to now, I mean, I, for my experience and from like the, the kind of stories that have been reaching me, um, Ghana has not been as hostile to the LGBTQ plus community as it has started being in the last few years. Um, this 
um, kind of took a turn when a few years ago um, there was a proposal to introduce a sexual education, a kind of um, education to for the youth in schools about a comprehensive sexual education about types of like genders, non-genders, um, sexual um, preferences, the spectrums of sexualities and so on. Mm. And this um, got a lot of opposition from mainly religious bodies, then from governments, from media, and then from the average colonially homophobic Ghanaian. Um, and since then, um, the homophobic Ghanaian has been on their guard about anything to do with the LGBTQ plus community. So up to about a year ago, when um, a safe space was created, self-funded by a group called um, LGBT Rights Ghana, um, when wind of this safe space got out, and the media raised tension so much in the public that the government sent um, national security to shut down the space place and send members of the community into hiding some of them were being hunted down and had to crash you know in people's houses for days for weeks and after that hunt kind of um simmered down um then a few months later there was a a meeting of paralegals of members of the lgbtq plus community from all over ghana in the area of Ghana, the Volta region of Ghana, in a town or city called Ho. And they were meeting there to discuss, you know, ways of surviving or thriving in Ghana as a member of the community to exchange networks, advice, support, therapy, just, you know, a support kind of meeting to educate as well. And 21 members of the community got arrested illegally by the police and were held for over 20 days um, in several jails spread across the town of Ho. It took a lot of noise making and especially I feel, which comes to, I guess, the core of your, your question that um, internet played a big role in this. We were able to mobilize and new groups started forming on the internet, especially on Twitter, groups like Silent Majority, and groups like Rightify Ghana, and of course, LGBT Rights Ghana as well, um, started gathering followers and sympathizers and allies to start pushing for the government to take a stance on the situation with the hostages, because we feel they were hostages and being mistreated and in custody before they were given bail after four or five hearings. And so, yeah, the internet played a big role in this. I could go on, so if you, if you have a following No, I would on. like you to go on, um, but mm -hmm. specifically go on about the ways the internet has served this movement from the Ghanaian perspective. The internet is always regarded as a motivator, motivates people to come out um, as a microphone as well. So what were the specific roles that the internet played in all this movement when um, things were not going well offline? Um, we can draw even parallels from um, the Lakey Tollgate shooting that if it wasn't for the internet, um, because most of media is now government controlled, we wouldn't have gotten like the truth about certain issues going on. And it's the same for Ghana, because Ghana is mostly homophobic, um, media houses will not amplify the plight of people, members of the LGBTQ community in, in the spirit of support and humanity. Um, news about the LGBTQ plus community will only be amplified when it's in the spirit of mockery, in the spirit of antagonism. And so, if it wasn't for the internet, which is not um, fully government controlled um, in Ghana, a lot of Ghanaians would not have been able to share information as easily and have information as accessible to them and to know, to keep up with what was going on because the media was hardly reporting any of it. And 
when the media did report something, most of the correspondents for the various radio and TV stations were taking mocking and homophobic stances. And so in a situation like this, the internet is definitely less judgmental and more of a level field for um, human rights violations such as this to be able to be amplified. So speaking to these same bills that we're talking about, this anti-LGBTIQA plus bill, um, what does one do when the main aim of gathering, using that power of the internet to gather, is not yet met? The Ghanaian government has gone ahead and pushed the bill to the next stage, despite um, the uproar, the outrage. Should we be gauging the success of these movements powered by the internet by what our governments do or should success be determined by the actions and changes that happen in the wider society what do you see as success in these internet mediated movements after you protest a bill that you see forming before your eyes and then find out that it goes to the next stage of it being read on the parliament floor there's no um, sense of success taking place. Um, however, you need to understand the power of the psychology behind our homophobia and the, the players behind the bill. Um, when you find out that there's more financial power, there's more ground movements behind the bill. I mean, this is a bill being sponsored by the World Congress of Families, which are uh, Islamophobic, right-wing, evangelical Christian group in America. And these are the people responsible for such bills being passed in Uganda, Hungary, Poland, and so on. I think even Nigeria. And so us protesting online is making us more aware of what's going on, but this protest is not reaching the older generation, which are not that tech savvy, which are not online really following the discourse most of the older generation are more concerned with the views of society and um, a supposed or a proposed um, African traditional culture, which is mostly like a colonial amalgamation of homophobia and Christianity and traditionalism and all this stuff. And so, um, and, and the strategy of these MPs which are pushing this bill is quite vicious. I mean, they go to radio stations and they threaten the radio um, personalities and TV personalities to be hostile to the LGBT community in the interviews. They have um, proposed that all parliamentary readings are done under live coverage of TV and radio so that um, constituents who are mostly homophobic um, have their eyes and ears on their members of parliament and so on to see who is going to support this LGBTQ plus community. And so there's a lot of, I'll say white mailing, but and racism makes us say black mailing, but white mailing of um, these MPs. And so even if some of them are more independent thinkers, are more progressive in fear of losing their political seats and power, a lot of them will vote in favor of this bill. So I really don't see success. I feel we are at a point where we are all kind of scampering and scratching and clawing and clutching at straws and threads. Um, currently, there has there's an email being circulated on Twitter and Instagram and so on um, for memoranda to be written to um, to respond to the points within this bill. So several of them, um, some of us have taken it upon ourselves to respond to the, to the bill and send this forward to some government officials who are going to read this if it's written correctly, typed out on A4 sheets. And there's this whole format that has to be followed for it to be considered and as a language that has to be used. And we are spreading this around to get as many people who have the power of words to see if we can reach the humanity left within these members of parliaments and politicians to be able to reverse this bill because the, at the crux of this bill, because of poverty, if such a bill passes, every blessed Ghanaian 
will be somehow criminalized and will be extorted from by authorities, by neighbors, by people in the community, because all you have to do is just say someone is gay. They have no way to prove if they are not or otherwise. Allies are criminalized. Lawyers for allies and LGBT community people are criminalized. Doctors who administer treatment for HIV plus LGBTQ plus community members are criminalized. And once this bill is passed in its current writing, anybody that comes forward to challenge this bill in the future will be criminalized. So it's, a, it's being dubbed the most homophobic bill in human history. That is a literal mic drop. Tari, I'm going to come to you um, quite quickly because I see a thread between what One Love has just said and what you said earlier. One Love is talking about um, a whole generation, a whole set of Ghanaians trying to find a way, going offline, yes, convening online, but also going offline, trying to print in languages what the bill means so that they can convert the last shred of humanity, as One Love calls it, in the other generation. Now, they have been proactive. But you have said um, earlier on, Tari, that um, in Nigeria, what you see when you ran for office at local government level was that we are a very reactive people. Something happens and then we're reacting. Um, in an earlier interview, you mentioned that the power of the local government has been underestimated and marginalized. So my question to you, Tari, has technology played a role in this reactive nature? And can technology and the mobilizing power of life redeem us? Well, um, yes, I think we can be redeemed by technology, but I think that technology has also had a large role to play in our reactive state. Because it's very easy to sit down in the comfort of your home, and all you need to do is type 100, 140 characters or less to get yourself involved in a conversation. And some, some people, depending on what your, your meaning is, may, may feel some sense of justification, thinking that you know, that little contribution is their part of a struggle, or however you want to, to frame it. But I think that um, technology can also be our redemption if we realize and apply the, um, the, the functional aspects of technology which are able to affect people's lives in real time. That's what we need to understand. I mean, if you look around us, I don't know, Nigeria, you know, different parts of Africa, the desperation that is calling out to us in terms of the quality of life of many of our people, it tells us that this is a now urgent situation that we all need to rise. You know, it's not enough. It is definitely not enough to, that your contribution to the development of our, of our continent should be from behind a smartphone in the comfort of where you are. You know, to, to achieve real change in any, in any development or in any civilization requires people coming out of their comfort zone. It requires you getting involved, getting your hands dirty, going into places that you typically may never do, going and listening to people, understanding life from their point of view, making contributions. Do you understand? So technology allows us to allows us the privilege of better analytics. Technology has allowed us the, the privilege, you know, of knowing or being able to access information at the tip of our fingers. Technology even allows us to disseminate information wider, you know, than we would ever have imagined. But we need to get out there. Because real life happens on the streets. Real life happens in the communities. Real life does not happen on Twitter and on Facebook. That is a that is a, 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 a virtual reality. It is not real life. Real life happens when a child is hungry and there's no way for that child to eat. Real life happens when somebody needs urgent health care and cannot get access to it. You know what I mean? Real life happens when uh, a young person is held in police custody for months and years on end and is not able to get even a fair trial or any form of justice. So these are real life situations that can never be solved from, you know, behind the screen. So we, 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 need to, we need to prioritize. We need to understand that there is a place for everything. You know, technology and, um, of course, our social networks and our interactions on those spaces, they have their place, absolutely. We cannot even, the world we live in now, you know, cannot even function 
without all the discourse that happens on Twitter and happens in all those places. But we need to understand that those things do not translate into economic growth. It doesn't translate into development in our local communities. It doesn't trans translate into better life at the grassroots communities. So, you know, this, this is what we need to understand. I think a lot of our generation has, we've gotten lost in this um, virtual reality. And we think that, you know, life and influence is confined to that space. But you see, the reason why our, our, our government always seems to be a step ahead of us is because they understand what we do not understand, which is that real power is not behind a smartphone. Real power is not in a virtual reality. Real power is in being able to make decisions every day that would affect the life of communities, nations, and generations, you know, going forward. So I think the minute we, this, the, we start to, you know, re-educate ourselves and really understand what is priority, then we will be able to separate things and actually do what is important and necessary for the time that we live in. So I have to say, I actually feel a bit dragged by you, Chari, when you said real power is not behind a smartphone, it's not being behind a smartphone, and that it is not enough to say you are participating in a democracy if all you do is behind a smartphone. I actually felt a bit of drag in my soul. One of, I don't know if you have any thoughts popping up that you want to share or any insights. What's your take on that? Real power does not come from being behind a smartphone. Yeah, thank you, Rona. I I think it's it's not that it's dangerous, but it would be a disservice to um, for Tari to just make it seem like it's only the outside world that has like the real importance because I mean, if the internet and Twitter was not important, Nigeria's government will not shut Twitter down. And also I've seen several um, calls to help on Twitter where within hours, sometimes days, tens of thousands of dollars have been raised for surgeries for different people, children, old people in Ghana, um, where the government, of course, has fallen short and where I don't feel this could have been accomplished walking around, asking people on the streets here and there, um, or even going to radio stations and asking for money because the internet links together the whole world. So even if a Ghanaian that's listening to a Ghanaian radio station um, cannot contribute money when it's, they're being solicited for funds to help a community or so on, a Ghanaian living in Alaska which follows Ghanaian issues on Twitter can help and so on. Or somebody who is not even from Ghana and the internet starts making the world a more global place where people from all over the world and other countries can contribute to the development of countries that they don't even belong to. So I feel, um, of course, it's also good to be out there to connect with people on the ground level to see what is going on but if we have such a tool as Twitter, Instagram, and so on, um, it will be sabotaging ourselves to not take advantage of it. There's still the argument that technology and the internet is still the preserve of the elite. I mean, those who are privileged to be literate, to have the means to afford data, to be savvy enough to even use the internet. But there's a trend that tends to happen with African internet use and its mobilizing power. Yes, I hear you, one love, when you talk about the fact that people use the internet to crowdfund, to raise awareness. But do you both agree that most of the time there's a heavy focus on online activism being solely to influence elections? So for instance, uh, mobilization on Twitter, for instance, in Nigeria, is quite a lot. Um, but suddenly, the slogan, elections are not won on Twitter, also started gaining traction. And this was after the Electoral Commission released results that only seven out of 20 people do go and vote. Seven out of 20 registered do end up going to vote. We see the same thing in Zambia, um, where candidates Kichilema opposition candidate just won a few months ago. And Zambia um, actually started 
convening on the internet where the candidate was very active. But they had, the youth had, you know, shirts that said, talk is cheap, we took it to the poll. So I want to ask you both, should we move from a place where the end goal of activism is always to influence elections, um, where most of the time it's always towards political activity? Um, Tari, I will go to you first. How can we, should we move away from this? And how can we make sure that our initial convening or pricing is translated to gains at the polls or societal change? How do we move from online um, to offline action? And should we focus on, on um, elections? Those are my points. Okay, so I think um, one love may have misunderstood a bit. I didn't say that, you know, it, um, the internet and all does not have its importance. I said it has its place. And we need to realize and utilize what its place is. And I like something he said. He said that it's a tool. I love that word. That's exactly what it is. It is a tool to an end. Whatever that end is, you want to so what is that end? It's social change in one form or the other. Or that end could be a uh, elections, influence, influencing the polls, whatever it is, you know, it's a tool for accomplishing whatever end that we choose to accomplish with it, which, which puts the power in our hands. So what do we want to accomplish? During the NSAS, it was social change. It, people wanted that, um, you know, police brutality to stop. That is social change. And the internet was used as a tool to galvanize people, you know, towards, um, you know, awareness and sensitization and towards action. So action now became gathering at the toll gate, getting the, the government, forcing the government to listen to us and, you know, take us, take the demands that we're making seriously. So we need to understand the, 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 what this tool can be used for. It's not an end in itself. The internet is not an end in itself. Technology is not an end in itself. It is always a tool to accomplish a goal. And I don't think that we should um, necessarily put a limit or put a barrier on what that goal should be. I think it is as necessary, you know, in one, in one instance, you know, police brutality is must, must stop. That is necessary for that time and that place. In another instance, we want to get more young people to participate in an election. That is another goal in for that time and that place. So we cannot necessarily streamline what our goals should be. Society is very dynamic. Every day, we all have different needs. Every day, you know, there are new demands that are placed on our leadership, on our government. So, you know, it, it's not something that can be static. It's whatever the need is at a particular time, the internet and technology can be used as a tool for us in actualizing those needs. So um, we must, that, that's the thing about what I, I'm saying about being strategic. We cannot be, technology allows us the, the um, how do I put it, the luxury of being reactive because it's so easy to react. It's so easy to, to give your opinion away on anything. 200 million opinions in Nigeria alone. I mean, come on. Everyone can give an opinion. But few people take action. Few people go out there and make the real changes because real change, you know, yes, I agree with one law. There are some changes that can happen from behind the smartphone when a lot of people come together and put pressure on an organization online. Things change like that. But we're talking about lasting change, sustainable change, change that shapes, you know, history, change, change that shapes generations. Those things are not going to be are not going to be done on, in an online community. Those things are policies. Those changes happen with laws. Those changes happen with policies, with bills, with galvanizing people at whatever level to do what is necessary. And what is politics at the end of the day? Politics is basically just the arrangement or the processes or the structures that give people what they want that determines who gets what. So every process you know, that can be actualized, whatever the means that we, 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 we use or we choose to use, you know, the idea is let's just be strategic, let's prioritize and let us know what is required for what so that we can use the necessary tools that we have to achieve real change, lasting change, sustainable change. 
Let me ask this question to Jibreen, since Sari and One Love have raised the notion of governments and how they are clamped down on um, the internet. Now, across the continent, Jibreen, we have seen not just social media shutdowns, but we've seen the more sinister form of internet throttling. And that's where full access to the web is denied. So all pages, all social media applications will not load and everything will be slowed down. What do you think this could mean for um, Africa and Africans' right to protest and the right to freedom of association, albeit on the internet? I think uh, African governments are very conscious of the power of the internet, of the power and capacity of the social media. In terms of its capitalist limitations, it still gives uh, great opportunities for people to reach across each other, to network among themselves, to pass on information, and above all, to orient advocates who are engaged in a specific topic towards lines of action where the mass, the strength of the masses can be activated. And precisely because of that, these governments are afraid. And because they are afraid, whenever there's something controversial or something they consider to be uh, important for them, they will close down the internet or specific platforms in the social media. And I think here the important thing is always to have a mix of your types of advocacy. Advocacy in the, in, on the internet is extremely important and uh, must continue. But at the same time, physical meetings are extremely important. Demonstrations are extremely important. Being on the front line is extremely important. When you have a combination of advocacy that's on the social media, but it's also on the streets, then closing down the internet doesn't stop the movement. It actually angers the movement, it motivates the movement even more, and based on that anger and motivation, more action occurs, and government attempts to curtail uh, engagement by younger people uh, fails. So I feel moving forward, that combination is extremely important. And if the young generation is able to combine effectively action on the streets with action on the social media, then the possibility of achieving objectives becomes much higher. So one love, I'm going to ask you um, this particular question that's been on my mind. Um, the in-depth way in which you describe the use of, this, of social media, um, I have to say highlighted the positive, but we do know that the same social media that um, helps people gather to effect all this change and do all this good that helps people in rural communities achieve political mobilization. That same social media is the same vehicle through which fake news is spread, homeland terrorism and radicalization is achieved across our continent. Um, how do we reconcile this? What role do you think government, tech companies and we as people have here, especially regarding the differences in generations? Twitter being banned in Nigeria, I feel like it greatly, I don't know what the government was trying to accomplish with that beyond um, beyond hearing um, like oppositional voices, especially from the youth, and maybe fearing um, it will light more fire to the society. 
um, whether righteously or unrighteously. But the economical damage it does to the country, um, so far as businesses, so far as the entertainment sector, is like, I think way more is lost, you know, than gain when um, social media is censored in such a totalitarian manner. I mean... So you feel government should be weighing the effects? Definitely. I mean, it's, it's in the interest of national security and it sh- shouldn't be tunnel vision to think it's just, oh, like we are being criticized, so let's turn it off. I mean, what are the other sides and what does democracy mean if you cannot be criticized? What other avenues are there for people to criticize? Um, in Ghana, there was a hashtag that was moment, momentarily banned and was free, release the 21 or free the 21. For a couple of days, that hashtag was not like, it, like Twitter was somehow, someone had told Twitter that this hashtag is like, like they somehow, I think they reported it under terrorism or something. And so Twitter for a couple of days did not allow that hashtag to thrive. And so I really, I really, really don't, I really like really feel I'm not that equipped to answer. Like beyond that, I feel that definitely just like in real life, when you walk out on the street and you're going to buy food by the roadside, there is a chance that you're going to meet somebody who is dangerous to your survival. And maybe it's a small chance, maybe it's a big chance, depending on the neighborhood in which you live. Same way on the internet, you are going to meet people who mean harm instead of good, you know, and are misguided and so on. But also depending on the society, you may meet more of such people which mean harm than less. And then the, who does the onus of that fall on? It's really for society and or the governing body of so the society to step in and step up. F- and that will reflect in the kind of discourses you see, you know, on the internet, because it's just another aspect of society. What you see on the internet is not, you know, it's not like some twilight zone. It's just a reflection, you know, so... I feel just as free as the physical society should be, the virtual society maybe even more so because we know that the physical society is not that free. Mm. The physical society is not that free. Terry, would you want to add um, any insights on that? Okay. Um, I mean, I agree with one long point of view in terms of that... um, in whatever, whatever it is in life, there would always be the positive and the negative. There would always be the, the, the great outcomes, and there would always be the ones that you were like, oh, I'm not so sure that this is, you know. But I, um, one thing I do know for sure is that there, there has to be some regulation for social media. That is, I mean, come on, there, there has to be, absolutely, you know. Um, that nothing in this life, you know, should be given entire free reign to function without any guidelines, without any sense of, um, you know, control or sense of um, how we want it to operate. Now, the question that one may raise is that what would be the dynamics of that regulation? Now, that's what we need to sit down and determine, you know, as all of us to kick against the regulation being entirely government-driven, because we know that that would bring restrictions to our freedom, our freedom of expression. So we need to come together. You know, and this is what I talk about being reactive. I feel that even as young people, we, that there, there is a place for engaging the government. We don't always need to take a position of criticizing the government and taking a position of being, uh, of being opposed to the government. Sometimes you actually, you actually need to really zone in on issues and look at, you know, look objectively, take your emotions out of it, take your rights out of it, just look at something for what it is, and you would realize that there may be some sense to some arguments. I believe biology means that social media needs a level of regulation, but we as the people need to determine how that regulation should be, you know, implemented. 
So of course there will there will need to be government participation, there will need to be civil society participation, there will there will need to be participation from the tech companies, you know, representatives of that demographic, there will need to be partic uh, participation from journalists like yourself, Rona. You know, so we all sit on a table and determine how best to make social media work for us. Because that's the key word. We don't work for social media. Social media is supposed to work for us. It's a tool. It's not supposed to um, overcome and overwhelm our entire life. So we sit down and decide, how do we want this tool to serve us? What do we want to accomplish with this tool? So what regulations do we need to put, you know, um, to put on the ground that would help us to achieve what these goals are? So that's my take on, uh, on, on, um, on social media. Definitely. It has changed the world that we know. It has made life so much easier for us on so many levels. It has increased the possibilities of activism and even governance and all of that. But it definitely has its negative. Too many people get hurt on social media. Too many lives get scarred on social media on a daily basis. You know, so we need to understand. Too many divisive elements, you know, are given a platform to actualize their, their sinister motives on social media. So we have to be we have to be a part of that conversation, you know. I don't subscribe to just opposing government and everybody protesting about you know government standpoint on regulation. No, we need to be understand and then we need to now you know work together and chart out the way forward. You know, have a voice, be strategic, have work out solutions, liaise with our government, engage them, you know, so that together we can we can we can you know we can make things work for all of us together, for all of us as a nation. I'm very glad you mentioned the word solution, Sarah, because that is my favorite word. Uh, and so I'm going to wrap up this session with this. Um, how can we reimagine um, changing society with the tools we have, technology, social media, the internet, while we will still have the opponents, you know, our semi-democratic, government, corrupt officials, terrorists, um, criminals, you know, all before us sharing the same space. I mean, so in a nutshell, what specific solutions should we be adapting to, to negotiate our reality of politics and activism using the internet while carrying along the older generation, which we will all end up being a part of? You know, as a society, young people, old, um, uh, elderly people in an older generation, we, we, we all have our role to play. We all have our, you know, our duty, you know, of what to bring to the table from experience, from knowledge, from technological know-how. We all have a role to play, okay? So we have to all be carried along. There, um, and, and the beauty of social media and, you know, and all of that is that it gives everybody a platform for discourse. And there's, there's, there's nothing as, as um, dynamic as discourse, being able to bring every opinion to the table, being able to see things from all points of view. It's like a cocktail of knowledge and wisdom and information. But out of that cocktail, we now dissect and draw out you know, the things that we believe can have a more sustainable impact. So um, I don't think that it's, a, it's, it's something that is just relegated to young people. I think that, you know, I don't even really see us as carrying the, the older people along. I think it's something that we all need to do together because we all want the same thing. I mean, I know people who are in their 60s who are very vibrant. In fact, they're even more vibrant than I can ever dream of being on social media because so it's not, it's not, social media is not something that is like age specific. Of course, there'll be a lot more young people because of technology, uh, savviness and all that. But it's something that, you know, um, everybody has a voice on this thing. Okay? So why don't we choose to amplify the voices that will take us to where we want to get to? Let us, let us know how to sift through the noise and find those voices that are speaking to our now and speaking to our future. So by the time we all do that, by the time we all have this collective vision of where we want to go, 
then social media and all of our discourse there would, would, would now be the swell, would now be the platform, would now be the conference centers where we now drive the agendas that are necessary to take us to the outcomes that we want. You know, so we, um, like, it, it's a very exciting time we live in. I mean, we have opportunity at the tip of our fingers. But um, like, I, like I said, I will say again, we have to be strategic with what we have. We have to learn, you know, to be less reactive, you know, and more determined, you know, in the goals that we set up. So it's not a generational thing. It's, a thing, it's, it's, it's an idea of purpose. It's an idea of identity. It's, a, it's, an, it's an idea of, you know, where we see ourselves and how we can collectively carry ourselves to those places, whether it's through our activism or whether it's through governance or whether it's, it's through citizenship. Wherever, you, wherever it is on the spectrum that you find yourself, be responsible with your platform. Set out the divisive you know, voices, set out the voices that seek to distract us. Let us be clear about what we want as African nations, as a continent, as young people. What, what kind of nations do we want to see in 30 years, in 40 years? Let us have a discourse about that, that collective vision on social media. Drown out the voices that are trying to divide us. Drown out the voices trying to distract us. Amplify the voices that, you know, align with that vision we set for ourselves and be more strategic about getting there. And then know what actions need to be translated into real-time impact. We know, we're, we're, let us not be afraid to get our books on the ground, go into communities, go into, you know, government, go into the, the, our legislative chambers and make impact when we need to. But we just, like I said, need to understand what the trade for what and when and when what is necessary and then do the needful. That's the only way that we're going to be able to accomplish real change with the tools that I believe we have been blessed with because no other generation in the history of the world has, has, has been so blessed with information, with access to technology, you know, everything that we have. So we are, we are in a very unique place in history, and I think that we need to use it, use it wisely. So one of, I'm going to go to you, and then you're just going to answer that question. What should we be doing? How should we be carrying along the older people? So over to you, Wanda. Thank you. Thank you, Rona. I really agree with what Tari said about it's not being like we shouldn't look at it as the older generation that we are carrying because I am of the strong when I hear like people of the older generation saying it's you the youth that have to now fix the wrongs that way I don't like hearing that I'm like whilst you're still taking in oxygen at this moment you should also be out there on the streets you should also be using, doing, getting twitter fingers and so on and so forth <laughs> now the danger she, she used the word which was like drown out voices that are not in line with what the people want now what do the people want most of the time in controlling governments the people want what the government wants them to want and so if we take a country that is dwelling on fossil fuels and is is, is basically addicted to fossil fuels and we all know that climate change is real there's a lot of stuff going on in the world now and we need to switch to cleaner energy we need to change our lifestyle our consumption our use of plastic our use of fast fashion where all these textiles are pollu polluting the ocean and so on and so forth if governments that are being you know that care more about corporations making money than the citizens then drowning out this dissident voices is not a good thing so we need to use technology in a way that is constantly shaping the people and hope for i mean fights for better government that do have the care of the people at the core to to go for these good things like fighting pollution fighting pedophilia fighting crime fighting corruption and use of course internet whatsapp twitter instagram all this to amplify that to spread news about you know positive social behaviors in society and design and shape a society to be let's say more like as an ideal example is denmark you know 
And so, yes, we need we need to use. There shouldn't be like a like a separation of generation. Everybody needs to be involved, and we need to have a common, you know, like a wholesome and uh, organic, you know, outlook on the future, and have government people appointed in government that care more about the average human being than the average corporation. And that way we can trust the government when we know they are thinking about us first and not about the pockets of a few people first. Now, I do know we have to wrap up, but Jibrin, I am interested in hearing um, from you on this. So I ask again, how can we reimagine society with the tools and the opponents we have, you know, corrupt officials, um, not so democratic governments. Um, what specific solutions should we be adapting to while carrying along the um, older generation as we negotiate um, this ever-changing reality? Today, we live in a country where the demographics has changed considerably. That is to say, Nigeria has become much younger than it was in our time. And uh, over 70% of the people in this country are young. When you look at politics and governance, however, you find that those in power in this country are elderly, they are old, they are tired. Uh, and that's one major difference between our time and this time. When Gowan came into power, for example, he was 32 years old. Uh, most ministers were in their 30s. Today, the majority, the uh, president of the country is almost 80. Most ministers are over 60 years old. And there is a dissonance between the language and expectation of those in power and those who are the majority in the country, the young people. So the context of engagement the context of advocacy has changed considerably. It is today we find ourselves that the distance between the governing class and the mass of the people is very wide. What I think in this real in this reality of today is that maybe the youth the younger generation, the great majority of Nigerians have not become conscious of the power of their numbers, of the power of demography, about the, uh, the way in which demographic dividends can be harvested by the young people. We live in a democratic political system where uh, the choice of leaders is through elections. If young people are over 70% of the population, why was it in this last election the two leading candidates were in their mid-70s, were tired, were not in touch with current realities, and were not actively engaged in creating opportunities for young people? The reason why the leadership we have emerged is that the youth are totally uh, unaware of the power of their own demography. If they engage massively in politics, if they join parties, if they form their own parties, and if they mobilize using the extensive capacity of social media to generate and transmit ideas, they can change the fundamentals of the politics and governance of this country. So my first point really is political organization. 
political organization based on the consciousness that the majority has the power and the majority is young. Thank you, Jibreen. Thank you, Tari. And thank you, One Love. But the biggest thanks and gratitude goes to you, our esteemed audience. Thank you for staying with us on this panel. I hope you enjoyed your time out with us. It's still the RK 2021 Arts and Book Festival, and the thing is generational discordance. Please stay tuned. We have more panels coming up that will be worth your while. And remember, you can tweet at us with the hashtag RKFest21, and don't forget to follow RK Festival. Take care and have a great day. Let me introduce a new way we change the rules, a new app that you can use. Wanna change your life? Then choose. Save money and invest. Pay bills when you decide. Safe and secure for you when you need a loan. Requesting one bank for you, one bank for me. So chill and enjoy the ride. Stop the current account on it. One bank. One bank by Sterling. Open a current account and start transacting.